Welcome, viewers. This is Gabriel Buelna, your host with Buelna News. And um, we're in season three. All of our episodes are excellent. Um, but today we're in uh, real time uh, breaking news um, with our guest today, uh, Adriana Chavira. But before we get to uh, Adriana, I want you to press subscribe right there and support our, new, our, 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 our news channel. Um, we're excited to bring you um, just up to date information. So today, it's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to have someone who is making news as, you know, as the time is, is clicking. We have Adriana Chavira. Adriana, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So, Adriana, you've been teaching at Daniel Pearl Magnet High School. Let me just go over a bit about your background for, for, for the viewers. Sure. At, at Daniel Pearl Magnet High School for 13 years. Um, you spent a decade working as a newspaper reporter be before becoming a teacher. Um, you um, have taught uh, journalism classes. Um, you were cert you're certified by the National Board of Certified Teachers, a master's in journalism educator. I mean, you have all kinds of accolades with regard to your, to, to, to your teaching. And um, for viewers to know, I've known Adriana now for quite a bit of time. We were <laughs> in undergrad in the in, in the nineties. I, I won't say early nineties. Okay, it was early nineties. Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, so Adriana, you know, um, you know, and um, you know, I remember you were student news, uh, a student reporter at the CSUN Sundial. Um, and your sister is a, is a teacher psychology at Cal State Northridge. So, you know, we, we are, we are matadors, but for today, even though all that, you have a lot of acclaim, um, you've been going through, um, some issues with, uh, LA, uh, USD. Right. Right. Um, so they recently gave me a suspension, uh, for three, un they gave me a three day unpaid suspension over, uh, a censor censorship issue. Uh, I'm an, the advisor of our news website, uh, news magazine, as well as the yearbook. I've been doing this now for 14. It's my 14th year here at Daniel Pearl Magnet High School here in the Valley. It's the smallest comprehensive high school in the district. Um, and it's a magnet school that teaches just journalism. That's the whole focus, journalism and communication. And uh, back in November of uh, 2021, my students published an article about um, LAUSD faculty or staff who were no longer allowed to be on campus due to their unvaccinated status. And so they published the story in sometime in like maybe mid-November. And then, so they published the story and they mentioned the name of our teacher librarian who left uh, the campus for, um, for that issue. And in November, I'm sorry, in December, she emailed me asking that her name be removed from the article. And so uh, I had the students, student editors decide whether they were going to do that or not. It's a student run newspaper. So I run it uh, like many uh, high school publications across the country or even college uh, publications. Students are the ones who decide the content. Uh, you know, they write the stories, they take photos, they edit, they publish it themselves. I, I'm there more as to guide them and make sure that they learn, you know, the journalistic style and all of that. And so they, you know, discussed whether they were going to take down the information. They contacted the Student Press Law Center, which is a national, it's a nonprofit organization that uh, offers advice to student journalists, whether it's in college, high school, uh, all across the country. And, and so they met with uh, an attorney there and they went over the story, how they did the reporting. And um, the attorneys said, no, you know, it's a newsworthy topic. Uh, you're allowed to keep it in there. And so they replied to the uh, teacher librarian and told her, no, we're not going to take down the information. And this is why it's newsworthy. And, um, you know, we have, I mean, everything in the story is correct. So they decided not, you know, not to remove it. And then in January of this year, um, uh, the principal asked me to take it down. And I said, no, and pretty much the same reason. I told him the same reason that the students gave the teacher librarian and then uh, since then, since January, there were different meetings um, for discipline. Um, and I was given several deadlines to take down the information. 
And I said, I was not going to remove it. And so in, um, in or September, right before Labor Day, uh, I was given a three day unpaid suspension. Uh, I appealed it. So, you know, I did not lose any, I still was still continuing to go to school and work um, during the appeal. And then uh, last, uh, last Friday, they decided to revoke the suspension. So uh, they cleared me from that. Um, so I'm glad they, that they did. So I will, I will not be, that will not be on my uh, personnel file. Um, and then during that time, there was a lot of uh, support from journalism organizations uh, saying, you know, saying that I should not be suspended for that. Uh, because California has a, a law, a California ed code that protects student journalists and also uh, student um as well as uh, journalism teachers like myself from retaliation for something that students uh, publish. So, you know, this, these charges against me should never have been brought up because the district should have known or sh should know uh, Ed Code 48907. And, you know, at the meetings that I, you know, was going to, I kept saying, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not, we're not removing that and the, and it's because of the Ed Code and they just didn't pay attention or didn't follow, or so, they did not pay attention to the code. So back to the librarian. Okay, so so she was saying HIPAA. What What, what is HIPAA for our viewers? Um, it's the, it's a, uh, it's a law that protects, you know, doctors or employers from uh, giving private information about, you know, their patients or their employees. Uh, however, journalists do not follow HIPAA, it does not apply to journalists. And that same thing does not apply to student journalists. But in this situation, what happened that that how did you guys know the information with regard to the librarian? The students had that information. Uh, they there were two at, at the beginning. There were two different students who were working on the story. Uh, one of them got that information. Uh, apparently, the uh, librarian mentioned it in her classroom. You know, even though she's a librarian, she also has students, you know, as a T.A. She has, I guess, T.A. students. Uh, one of them was one of my editors. Um, and so apparently she would talk about that. Uh, and, you know, she had them research, things like that, um, you know, vac the vaccination, all of that. So they knew that. Uh, and then after she was gone, they communicate, they communicated several times through email because they wanted, obviously they wanted to interview her. Uh, she declined the interviews, but then she would say some things in the emails um, about, I mean, she could go off on tangents in the emails. So no one, no one broke into any, any file. The information was gotten because she made it in you guys, the students sourced it from information from class. Right. Yeah. I mean, no one, you know, no administrator from the school gave it to us. Uh, you know, I didn't give it to the students, you know, they got it on their own. Okay. So let, let's, you know, the, the interest, the, the, the story specifically interesting to me for, for a few reasons. One you have a First Amendment, and the First Amendment is an issue about the state, the state controlling. Most people, if they're if they're in a private conversation, they, they're like, I have a First Amendment right. Well, no, you don't. Right. It's a First Amendment with regard to government speech, uh, controlling your speech. That that's a it's a First Amendment. But it also it's a story because of you. You said no. Right. Um, then we have another pillar of where you actually teach at. So you have these three things, right? The uh, 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 LAUSD, which most people forget that it's a state institution, it's government, right? You have you, the institution of an individual with a long history of family, we'll get to that. But but let's talk about, about Daniel Pearl, Pearl, the individual, and let me let me go to the main website uh, to the website it says about the the school we offer a safe supportive learning environment in which every student benefits from rigorous academics and, and a focus on journalism and communication i'm going to focus on the word safe mm -hmm. safe so we have a school that's named after a journalist and i'll i'll, I'll let you tell tell me uh, kind of what happened to him and then his family actually came out in support. But this is a school that's supposed to be at, at its highest caliber, right? And, and, and you defended it. My biggest concern is why didn't LAUSD keep that to that standard 
that that school was created for. Can, can you tell me about Daniel Pearl, the family and the legacy, which you stood up for? Yes. Uh, so Daniel Pearl was a journalist uh, and he was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He was uh, based in Pakistan and he, uh, in 2002, soon after 9-11 happened, he uh, was kidnapped uh, and he was killed uh, while he was reporting. And definitely it's a tragic story. Uh, his family's here in Encino. So, you know, my school, Daniel Pearl Magnet High School, is located in the valley, uh, the I guess the uh, Northwest Valley. And um, his family, his family uh, is active in our school. You know, we have an annual concert that's actually happening next month. It's called uh, Daniel Pearl World Music Day. It's technically uh, a worldwide or yeah, international celebration. Um, you know, different countries, uh, locations have concerts in Daniel Pearl's memory because he, he was also a musician. And so our, our the music teacher at our school, you know, he always puts on a concert and students perform and it's all to honor Daniel Pearl and his legacy. Uh, his parents, you know, usually come to the concert. Uh, his mom, uh, Ruth Pearl, died uh, last summer. And my students, they wrote an obituary. She died. You know, she's a part of our community. And so they wrote an obituary when she died. Um, and so the father always comes and speaks at graduation. Um, so, you know, his family comes and, you know, my students um, are are very dedicated student journalists. They're often finalists for the Los Angeles Press Club. And his parents are also always at the Press Club uh, Awards because one of the awards that are handed out are the Daniel Pearl uh, Courage Awards. And so, you know, the Pearls know my students, my students interview them all the time. So they're familiar with my work, the caliber, uh, the caliber of my students. And so definitely they came out in my defense saying, you know, she should not be suspended. Um, and so that was very, you know, I'm, I was very touched that they did that. Uh, they took their time and, you know, uh, worked with the student, I'm sorry, the Los Angeles Press Club and issued a statement. Uh, they were and they were among many organizations that did that. So let's talk about. Um, uh, 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 thank you. So the, the the school was named and dedicated to great journalism. Um, you know, so I, I think there's something to be said that you know for the family to be defending you and congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. But to LAUSD, right? So as you were going through that process, there's several news reports. I'm sure you you you've read the, read them all. Tell me how an institution that has so many attorneys, I know attorneys who work at LAUSD, they're great attorneys. I don't understand how a, such a clear First Amendment issue gets through LAUSD legal. I mean, it, it, it's very upsetting. And, you know, and, you know, I, I'm also on a, on a public board and was this and sometimes you have the HR side thinking that they're attorneys what ha what happened was this legal who got it wrong HR who got it wrong and it's irrelevant let me, let me just say if you can answer that for a second but I also get to the part of the institution that if they have such a great institution like your high school how did they let this happen so I know there's a lot there there I mean I st I don't understand. Yeah, I still don't understand. Nine months later, I still don't understand why this even happened. Uh, because for all the reasons you said, uh, from the very beginning, I cited California Ed Code 48907, which has been in the books in California uh, since the late 70s. The one, the section of that code that protects uh, uh, ad journalism advisors like myself has been in the books for um, probably 15, 20 years. Uh, one of my journalism mentors actually was one of the catalysts for that law. So I was, I'm very well versed in that. Um, and so I don't know why the district did not pay attention to that. I pretty much, every time I met with, you know, the um, principal, someone from HR, and then my union rep, I kept saying that, you know, we're not removing it because, you know, and I always cited the code and it just went nowhere. Um I don't know whether at what point or even if legal got into it at all. I don't know. But it just baffled me. I mean, the Student Press Law Center also met with me and they are like, there has to be more to this because we don't understand why they're still going. You know, they haven't dropped it because there's no way, no reason why it should have been, it should have even been um, 
whether, you know, they should not even attempt it to censor us for that. Here's 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 what's upsetting to me. And, I, and I'm an attorney as well, is that is that, you know, and, and I'm asking the, the, the superintendent. How do you what occurred? Because when the state attempts to censor you, it's not just a school. It is a state institution, um, which is the whole point of the Constitution to protect against that. So you have fe the federal constitution, a state statute. How can an institution such as LAUSD be so irresponsible? And 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 I I know you're saying you don't you don't get it, but to a certain extent, this is a story in terms of what was the chain of command? Did the superintendent know? Do the do the school board members know? And did they not understand? the statute, the law, and, and if it didn't mean anything, is there is there a bigger story there from from this? Uh, there, I mean, I don't know everything behind that. Uh, I'm just at the school level. I so all of that, I don't know. I know that many people did contact, uh, you know, they contacted, they said letters to the superintendent, board members. Uh, but Personally, I've never heard anything from them. Um, the principal hasn't said anything to me, hasn't talked to me. I passed by him in the hallway. It's a very small school. We only, we only have like 14 staff members. So it's not like a huge school. We only have 220 kids. It's a very small school. You see everyone pretty much every day. Um, but no one has said anything to me. I have no explanation as to why this happened. Um, and that's kind of why I kind of stood my ground because in, I mean, I pretty much know all the journalism teachers in LAUSD. And my program is, you know, one among the, you know, two or three best ones in the district. And if they're doing, if they're coming after me for this, you know, I don't want them to come after, you know, a teacher who has also teaching English and, you know, their journalism class is just one of the, you know, four or five classes that they're teaching. You know, whereas I, I mean, I'm teaching journalism the whole day. That's all I teach. You know, I'm an English teacher as well. I have a credential, but my passion is journalism. That's what I want to teach. And, you know, I and other teachers, they could have easily folded and saying it's not even worth it, you know. And so that's why I kind of stood my ground, because in California, this should not be happening. You know, there are only 16 other states that have strong uh, laws in their books to protect student journalists. Um, you know, if we were one of the other states where, you know, they have no protection, you know, they could easily, you know, fire me for that, you know, and, you know, if they had not revoked it, they could have, you know, worked on to moved on to, you know, fire termination. Me. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, being at a school, right, being a journalist, being at it at a school that's supposed to be the top notch, the elite of the elite with regard to journalism. What did this tell you about the stress test that occurred on your campus? I mean, it was this must have I mean, I'm talking about supported you know were you support were you supported by the principal no no okay no. how how about your colleagues uh, colleagues yes yes colleagues are supportive however they didn't i guess they had to be careful about vocalizing it, it was, they weren't going to go and confront the principal we only have one administrator on campus so you know they also have to watch i guess you know they had to watch their backs uh, you know because they're afraid that they may you know he may come after them Okay, so at a journalism school, Ms. Chavida, mm -hmm. you had the principal who's dedicated to, and I and I know you're still working there, you know, dedicated to supervising. Teachers are afraid to speak because they have to watch their back. I mean, you you have to, as a citizen of, of Los Angeles, you have to. That's that's. I, I mean, yes, am sir. I okay? Yeah. So how? <laughs> so I'm a loss for words as to how you, so the, th this incident did not, not survive the stress test. No, no. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I'm doing, well, I can control what goes on in my classroom. And so that's what I'm focused on. My teaching has not suffered. I'm still, you know, giving it my all. Uh, I dedicate my time. I still, you know, stay after school with students as they work uh, to put together their, you know, pages for the magazine. Um, I put in a lot of hours and I'm still doing that this past weekend. I went, I was, uh, I spent Saturday at a journalism workshop with students. I have another one scheduled next month. Uh, so I'm still giving it my all, you know, so, 
you know, pretty much my classroom is what I can control. Um, you know, I'm not going to worry about, you know, the principal, um, because, you know, principals change, you know, they, you know, they're moved from one school to another, you know, so, and my, 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 um, colleagues, you know, they, they're supportive, you know, my students interview them a lot, you know, so we, I mean, because we are a small school, I have, you know, most of my students are in, you know, everyone else's classes. Um, and the parents? Parents are supportive as well. Uh, I got a lot of emails from parents. I got a, a lot of emails from alumni. Um, you know, some I hadn't heard maybe in like 10 years. Some who already, you know, uh, they're, you know, in the, either studying journalism in college or, you know, they're already working in the field. So I did get a lot of support. And a lot of them were, you know, just flabbergasted that something like this could even happen. So in terms of the uh, the process, so uh, what was the role of United Teachers of Los Angeles, UTLA, in this process? I had a rep there, uh, I guess, just to monitor what was going on. Uh, early on, uh, I did ask if I was gonna, if I was eligible for legal representation. He said no, because there's certain barometers it has to meet. I was told no. Uh, he early on told me that I had to, you know, to just remove the information and then fight it later. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's no way I'm going to remove the information. Um, and so that was pretty much my representation the whole time until maybe about two weeks ago when I finally did get some attorneys from the union uh, who drafted this letter that the union rep read at the appeal hearing or appeal meeting. Um, and everything in that letter referred to California Ed Code uh, 48907 and saying, you know, that, you know, we do not have to, we should not have to remove that information due to the code. I should not be retaliated against or suspended due to the code. And, you know, so everything in their defense uh, that they wrote in defense of me was referring back to the Ed Code. Um, so, Ms. Chavi, so, I mean, so huh. and, and let, me, let me, you know, um, Tell me how this has caused, I mean, uh, the effect on you as, as, as an individual. I mean, this, well, definitely this stressful. I mean, it's stressful, um, but, you know, my students, you know, make me proud. Um, okay. It's been, it's, I mean, oh my God, <laughs> it's been tough um, and stressful, but um, I mean, I'm getting through it. I'm getting through it. Um, yeah. So let, let's let's get to let's get to something that'll make you smile. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've I've known you for a very long time, and um, I know your sister. I interviewed her for for a radio show that I did. It, um, you you have an awesome family, mm -hmm. and I remember one thing as as you know there was a lot of protests in the early in the early nineties, and I remember the Rudy Acuna battles at UC Santa Barbara Proposition One Eighty Seven, and one thing that always um caught my attention is that both of your parents were at every single protest that you were at yes they're also they're fighters they're activists um and uh they also supported me through this they said no you know you can't um let the administration tell you what to do um they said you know you need to stand up for your students so they were with me the whole time where's your where's your where's your family from um my dad is from Michoacan. my mom is from veracruz okay. so excellent food um <laughs> And and were they activists in Mexico or here? No, it was more here. Uh, they got active maybe in the late eighties um, with um, when Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas was running for president. Nineteen eighty-eight. Yes, <laughs> he was. Uh, he made frequent visits here to gather support from uh, expatriates. So they, you know, they were out here. They supported him, and from there, you know, they became activists. And then when obviously when I you know went to Cal State Northridge and my sister also went to Cal, Cal State Northridge. They were activists. My youngest sister went to San Jose State. Uh, but even on her campus, she was very active in uh, Mecha as well. You know, um, so as part of that that pillar, and I think, you know, when, when folks understand that, you know, the state went after you. I, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant whether you lost pay or not. Mm -hmm. They put you on suspension, right? So the state went after you. And and I and I think what 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 what's amazing for for me is that the institution failed you. Mm -hmm. it, it it just it did right? right. The 
but the institution of your family. And I, and, and, and I just happen to know this because I've, you know, known you and followed you, you know, I, I it's just everything, th- th- what it takes to, to make an individual. And obviously you made that decision, but your family, your environment, everything was your family part of the decision making in terms of when you said no? No, my I'm, I didn't tell my parents until. But their after background, I, I meant the background. Yeah. The, you no, know, my, yeah, yeah. My parents did not know anything about this until I got suspended. I didn't want them to worry. They're, I mean, they're older. They're elderly. I didn't want them to worry. Um, I have one sister who works in HR uh, for a public agency, so she has a different viewpoint. Um, and I have a brother-in-law who uh, is kind of also in administration, so he can, you know, they can. They they are they can see the other side, so they didn't understand, you know. They didn't understand why we published it, why we published the name. Uh, I had explained it several times, but you know they were on board with me. They you know obviously they're supportive of me. Uh, they know how much I dedicate my time to my students. Um, so they, I mean they kind of had a hard time understanding that part. Uh, but I explained that from the beginning, you know, we had the state law that protects students, gives students the same rights as, you know, professional journalists. And that's why, you know, a lot of organizations, journalism organizations uh, from across the country uh, wrote letters of support also because they're saying, how can this be happening in California? California has some very strong laws to protect student journalists and they should not be censored. And it's a, you know, it's an issue of censorship um, at a journalism school. And so it's just, named after a journalist. So there was just a lot of irony in this whole case, um, which never should have gone on this long. So so ultimately, I mean, and you saw, saw this within your own family, that there is another side, right? So what what is that other side? Um, I guess having people, you know, know some information about you, you know, but, you know, during the pandemic, my students continued covering, you know, even during distance learning, they covered a lot of stories about COVID. You know, we taught, we wrote stories about mental health, which is a, definitely a touchy issue with students. What they covered, they interviewed students who were going through mental health issues. Uh, we covered, uh, you know, when kids got COVID, you know, we they interviewed kids who got COVID. So, you know, covering, you know, unvaxxed teachers or, you know, the, the district removing them, um, that's newsworthy. You know, that was just another of the angles to the whole COVID pandemic coverage. So for us, it's just, you know, business as usual. It's another story that they're covering and they're, you know, telling their story. And that's what they're supposed to do as student journalists, cover their community. You know, um, and you're, you're, you mentioned Guatemala Cardenas and and, you know, visiting in 1988 and the number of journalists being killed in Mexico has been very high and around the world as, as well. And, and, and to me, this story was, was um, an example of journalists play a cleansing role to a certain extent in a democracy, right? It's just not a business. It's part of the democratic process. Right. And I and and even within your own family I, I, and institutions, I'm not sure that they get or or maybe sometimes view journalists mm-hmm. as threats. And is that part of the process? I mean, for for journalism around the world, and how do we deal with that? I don't know. I mean, I don't see the. I mean, obviously, I was a former journalist, uh, so I don't know. I don't. See those threats are those who are hiding something right. or don't want the public <laughs> to know something. Um, and, you know, journalists are, you know, out there trying to tell a story, let the public know what's going on. Uh, we're not there to tell only, you know, positive stories. You know, um, you know, the, even the publication, you know, a student newspaper, it's not the PR vehicle for a school. Yeah, we tell, you know, a lot of great stories. You look at, you know, what we publish, look at our social media, we're covering, you know, what kids are doing what they're learning in the classrooms. Uh, But then, you know, we always tell, you know, we always also tell the stories of, you know, what is life of a teenager today? You know, what are they going through? You know, there are good sides and, you know, sometimes the bad things too. And so we cover all of that. My students don't shy away from anything and, um, you know, they don't plan to, you know, 
self-censor either. You know, they're going to continue covering tough issues like they've always done. Um, you know, and I never, you know, told my students, oh, you can, you know, publish that or we're not going to cover that because it's going to make the school bad, look bad. So is there one, I want to thank you for coming on and, and talking about this. I, I know it's been difficult. Is there, is there anything that you would like to tell um, other journalists, journalist students currently um, I, and in the future? Um, I guess, you know, definitely stand your ground. Uh, I know my students are doing that. Uh, it's been tough for them, but there's, you know, they've stayed their ground um, or stood their ground and, you know, as long as you do well reporting, you know, don't be afraid of uh, ruffling the feathers of people. Uh, you know, always let your accurate writing um, stand for itself or speak for itself. And, you know, also and obviously stand for your convictions as well. And what would you tell LAUSD with regard to making sure that this doesn't happen again? They need to learn the law. Uh, and brush up on it. And um, actually, one of the when uh, one of the when the, the attorneys for the union asked for three things. Obviously, what the first one was to, to rescind my suspension. Second one was to delay or defer my performance evaluation because the day after I got suspended or was told of my suspension, I got a notice from the principal saying that I was going to be evaluated this year. And so I'm like, I don't want him to evaluate me this year because obviously there's some tension there. I don't think I would get a, a fair evaluation. I'm a great teacher and I just want to make sure that, you know, there's no, uh, I don't get any sort of bad review. Uh, and I, and, you know, he did send me a few days ago that I was not going to be evalu evaluated this year. So that's a good thing. The third thing the union asked for was in writing, they want the district to acknowledge that they will abide by uh, California Ed Code uh, 48907, as well as the First Amendment. And they want that in writing. That's what the third thing that they asked for. And as far as I know, the district has not, uh, is not going to acknowledge that one. And, so, and I hope they did. So you're asking LAUSD to follow the law and the Constitution? Yes. Okay. When, uh, it comes I, to when it comes to student journalists and their advisors. And as far um, as I know, they're not doing that. And I, I didn't, I didn't hear a a request for an apology in there. As um, maybe, maybe that's a little going too far. Um, I'm not expecting one, and I'd be surprised if I ever get one. All right, um, you have the last word. Is there anything else? No, I think I think right. that's thank you, audience. Adriana Chavira. Um, one of those individuals that keeps our democracy going and i'm honored to be known press the subscribe button like it share the video have a good evening everyone we're out